Good evening and welcome to the 2023 Royal Institute of Philosophy Lecture at Cardiff University. I'm Dr. Mary Edwards, your host for the evening, and it is my great pleasure to introduce this year's speaker, the Pre Presidential Professor of Philosophy at the University of California, Los Angeles, Paul C. Taylor. Professor Taylor's research focuses primarily on aesthetics, the philosophy of race, American philosophy, and Africana philosophy. His monographs include Race, a Philosophical Introduction, published with Polity in 2004, with a second edition in 2013. Black is Beautiful, a Philosophy of Black Aesthetics, published with Blackwell in 2016, which was awarded the American Society for Aesthetics Outstanding Monograph Prize in 2017, and on Obama, published with Routledge in 2016. He has also co-edited The Philosophy of Race and The Routledge Companion to The Philosophy of Race, authored the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on contemporary Africana philosophy, and published new, numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals and volumes on topics including moral perfectionism, Afro-pessimism, decolonizing analytic philosophy, and philosophy of literature. Tonight, I believe that Professor Taylor is going to explain how we might dig some hope out of the darkness of our current times in his paper entitled Dark Futures, A Philosophical Archaeology of Hope, an enterprise which I'm sure our viewers will agree feels more urgent now than ever. The lecture will be followed by a question and answer session and those of you who are watching live are warmly invited to join in the session by posting your questions for Professor Taylor in the box to the right of your screen. So that's enough from me. Over to you, Professor Taylor. Thank you so much, Dr. Edwards. I'm grateful to you and your colleagues for giving me this opportunity to speak with you, to think with you, uh, to think with you and your uh, audience. Uh, it's a real privilege, and I'm grateful uh, to be given the chance uh, to be in conversation with you all. Uh, I have some slides. I have a slide deck that uh, I've prepared, and the uh, remarkable tech team behind the scenes here has pledged to help me uh, work through those slides. And you'll see the first slide um, on the screen in front of you. I'm going to come to this one in a second. So. So the starting point for my reflections tonight is um, a peculiar habit we have in English. Perhaps it's not that peculiar. Um, it's not distinctive to English, but English is the language I know best. Uh, we have this habit of using metaphors of light and dark to distinguish good and bad, better and worse, good and evil, progress and decline. Um, as I say, this habit exists in other languages. And for all I know, there it may be a cultural universal and with defensible roots in evolutionary psychology. Um, don't care a great deal about that right now. What I do care about is the uh, ubiquity of this practice, uh, the fam familiarity of it, and certain peculiar features of it. Uh, this habit of using metaphors in light and dark to distinguish between richly evaluative uh, binaries once led us to speak of the dark ages before historians corrected us. It led Bertolt Brecht to begin uh, a poem in 1940 with the line, truly I live in dark times. Uh, this is a familiar habit we have. It probably goes without saying that it is a habit that makes perfect sense in the moment we currently inhabit. This peculiar linguistic habit gives us the resources to think of this moment, moment of global pandemics, of assertive autocrats, of terror attacks, of climate devastation, as a particularly dark time. I'm going to be concerned with some features of this moment in a second. You see on the screen in front of you uh, some images of the features that I'll be interested in. One of them is from uh, to 2021. One of them is from 2014. One of them is from the past few days, the past week. I'll come back to these. That's just to set the stage. It is, of course, the case that we have a great many more reasons to think of the time that we inhabit as a dark time. 
beginning with some of the things that I've mentioned, uh, prospect of uh, climate devastation, global pandemics. And so it makes sense that we tap into this habit, right, of uh, referring to dark times. But it is important to be careful with this metaphor. It's important to be careful for some of the reasons that have led historians to uh, discourage us from speaking of the dark ages and the way that we've for many years were accustomed to. Um, it's a habit that can um, numb us to the dangers of assigning ethical characters, ethical traits to people who look one way rather than another. Um, this idea of the darkness being richly loaded can obscure things in just the way that the fact of darkness can obscure things. Interestingly, though, one of the things that can obscure is uh, the richness of the idea of the dark, which is to say darkness is not all bad any more than all dark people are bad. Um, any more than the dark ages were a time of seamless global uh, uh, benighted sensibilities or uh, cultural lack of sophistication. So one of the things I want to do today, the main thing I want to do today, is think through what it means to think of the darkness in richer ways than this, to think of the idea of dark times in richer ways than this. I want to think in this spirit with uh, people like Virginia Woolf. If we can go to the next slide. So six months into World War I, Virginia Woolf wrote in her diary the following words. The future is dark, she began. She went on. But dark is, I think, the best thing the future can be. I wonder what it means to think of dark times in this way. Uh, I wonder in particular what it means to think of dark times in this way at the beginning of an extraordinarily destructive, devastating moment in human history, at the beginning of what was at that point the most destructive conflict that the human race had ever seen. What does it mean to think of dark times as promising, right? As uh, rich as full of potential we have more linguistic habits that point in the direction of this thought we are fond of saying things like uh the night is always darkest before the dawn uh we're fond of hearing or we're used to hearing people like martin king say things like um only when the night is darkest can you see the stars right we have ways of getting in the neighborhood of what virginia wolf was interested in but i think there's something deeper that's at stake for her it's not just that darkness is something to work through on the way to something good or something to endure on the way to something good. It's that the darkness itself is rich with possibility. It's that the darkness itself has something to offer us. Uh, this is an idea, I think, that we can work through with assistance from the great American mystic Howard Thurman. We can go to the next slide. So Howard Thurman wrote a book in 1965 called The Luminous Darkness. He wrote this book uh, in the middle, in some ways, of uh, near the end, in other ways, depending on which historians you're interested in, which account of these things most moves you, uh, of the American, uh, Black American liberation struggle. And he wanted to provide in this book, he said, a personal interpretation of the anatomy of segregation and the ground of hope. And he used this idea of the luminous darkness, an idea he borrowed from Homer, to capture the thought that there is something in the darkness itself that can recommend possibilities to us, that can represent uh, the occasions for the ground for hope, that can banish the thought that darkness is simply a warrant for despair. So if we can go to the next slide. This is the idea I want to work through. I want to work through it in uh, some proximity to some features of our current moment. As I said, it's, there are ample reasons to think of the current moment as uh, uh, providing us with the warrant for despair. We have ample reasons for thinking of this as a dark time. I want to suggest we have some reasons for thinking of that darkness in the spirit of Virginia Woolf or Howard Thurman. In that spirit, I want to ask the questions you see in front of you. What can make this darkness luminous? Where might we find, where might we find the ground of hope? My answer will involve gestures in the direction of the, the three bullets you see. 
what it takes to make the darkness luminous will have something to do with refusing innocence, with embracing agency, with recognizing humanity. This will sound banal, but one of the things that I think we find in dark times is that uh, things that under different conditions would seem banal, things that under different conditions seem like small things become extraordinarily important. They become reminders of things uh, that demand our attention and require more of us than we might otherwise think. So these are the questions I want to take up. The answer will take something like this shape. Uh, before I do that, I need to do some other things. Next slide, please. So I'm going to have to tell you what I mean by hope. I'm going to have to tell you what it means to look for the grounds of hope in the spirit of Howard Thurman and what method, if it deserves the title method, uh, I'll use to undertake this exercise. And then I'm going to return to images like the ones that you saw in the first slide, images that uh, harken back to 2014 and 2021 and the events of the past week. I want to dig through those scenes of devastation and see if there are ways to turn them into sites of hope. I should say a word about why I'm using these particular scenes or images. The thoughts I'd like to share with you, the thoughts I'd like to think with you tonight are thoughts that I started thinking in 2014 in the wake of uh, the events that will be uh, reflected in the first image I'll work through. My hope was to organize a series of sustained reflections around my response to this moment. This was meant to be a book. The book declined to get written because scenes of devastation continued to pile up in ways that continued to demand attention. And so here we are almost 10 years later, and uh, the project has continued to take different shapes. Um, one of my hopes for tonight is to give you a sense of what it means to think about this kind of thing now after not just uh, the first event, but a series of events of different kinds on different scales uh, that contribute to the thought that we live in a dark time. So the shape of the project is to some degree autobiographical. Uh, it is autobiographical, though, in the sense that animates uh, exercises of the essayist art. The burden of the essayist is to think thoughts that anyone could think, but to think them in ways that are provocative, to think them in ways that allow the writer to stand in to some degree as a representative for all of us, and to try out ways of, uh, as essayist Rebecca Solnit says, gathering up the shards of a fragment in experience and composing them into a single, uh, to some degree, provisionally uh, unified whole in a way that is hopefully illuminating in a way that occasions reflection and makes that reflection productive. Uh, so that's the shape of the project. Uh, this is the plan uh, for today. And with that, I'll launch right in. Next slide, please. So I will not have a great deal to say about what hope is. There is a great deal to say about it. I will not have a great deal to say about it. A great many other people have a great many things to say about it. What I want to say is something very much like what Katie Stockdale says in her remarkable book, Hope is Under Oppression. Hope Under Oppression. Uh, she says, and I quote her in the words you see on the screen, I understand hope roughly as a way of seeing or perceiving in a favorable light the possibility that a desired, and I would say uncertain, outcome obtains. And although there remains significant room for debate about how to precisely characterize hope, I, for the most part, set this debate aside. Like Professor Stockdale, I want to set the debate aside, not because, it, not because it is not worth our attention, but because it is a different kind of exercise and it takes us in a direction I prefer not to go. Like Professor Stockdale, I want to think in very close proximity to sort of vernacular conceptions of hope. When we use the word hope, we all pretty much know what we're up to. There are differences that come out the more we think about the implications of remaining hopeful under certain conditions. The more we think about uh, what hope allows us to do, prevents us from doing, the degree to which hope empowers or disempowers, there are complications that arise. There are debates to have. There are arguments to undertake. I want to bracket all of that. I want to think about something very much like the vernacular conception of hope and explore the possibility for finding grounds for that vernacular conception or something that answers to it. In the scenes of devastation, I want to think through with you. Next slide, please. So having told you what I take hope to mean, I need to tell you what 
kind of method I will use to look for it. Uh, in doing so, I hope to cash out uh, the other key theoretical term that appears in my title. I offered you or proposed to offer you a philosophical archaeology of hope. I mean, archaeology and something like the way Tony Morrison does. And a wonderful contribution to a book of essays on the art of the memoir and the art of, uh, the art of biography. Morrison offers us an account of what she calls literary archaeology. Uh, she begins this wonderful essay by saying, it's a little weird for me to be part of this project. I'm not a, a memoirist. I'm not a biographer. But on reflecting on my process and my practice, it has become clear to me that one of the things I'm doing is teasing out fragments of memory and reconstructing the worlds that those fragments came from or belong to. These are, this is her language for uh, the method that I'm describing, I quote her, you journey to a site when you work in this way to see what remains were left behind and you reconstruct the world that these remains imply. And speaking of remains, she has in mind, she says beautifully in the essay, uh, she has these bits of memory, the, the way a relative laughed, right? The way uh, someone moved, the, the, the smell of something cooking in the kitchen, right? And from these fragments of memory, she could rebuild or would work to rebuild the world that those fragments pointed to and belong to. Next slide, please. So in this spirit, she says, I can't tell you how I felt when my father died, but I was able to write Song of Solomon and imagine not him and not his specific interior life, but the world that he inhabited and the private or interior life of the people in it. These people, people like her father, are my access to me, which is why the images that float around them, the remains, so to speak, at the archeological site, surface first and they surface so vividly and so compellingly that I acknowledge them as my route to a reconstruction of a world. That's literary archeology. span Next slide, please. I propose to take some cues from this method and engage in something that I want to call philosophical archeology. span uh, The images that I will work through are not slips of memory from fugitive experience but they are images among the stream, the river, the torrent of images that we are routinely bombarded with at, um, at the uh, behest of various uh, media streams. My aim is not to reconstruct worlds that have been, as Morrison says, disremembered, and disremembering is not the same as forgetting. My aim is not to reconstruct these disremembered worlds. My aim is to recover underappreciated existential resources for declining the thought that the darkness of our times is simply a warrant for despair. Existential resources in support of the thought that the darkness of these times is itself an ind indication, an in indication of possibility and an invitation to explore and seize those possibilities. Next slide, please. So the first image I wanna start with is an image that belongs to the constellation of experiences that launched me on this project 10 or so years ago. This is an image that many people found on their TV screens as they were thinking about what was happening in Ferguson, Missouri in the wake of Michael Brown's killing, uh, the encounter between Michael Brown and policeman Darren Wilson. These are images that appeared on many people's screens on uh, broadcast news um, outlets after the St. Louis County Grand Jury declined to indict Officer Wilson uh, for killing Mr. Brown. Scenes of devastation, scenes of anger, scenes of outrage on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, paired with what was happening at the very same time, President Obama issuing an appeal for calm. For many people, this moment was striking. The first image I shared with you on the first slide was a photo that um, a member of the editorial team of the Wall Street Journal took of a bank of televisions, right? Each of which is turned to a different channel, each of which is showing some version of this split screen. There is a reason this struck people in the way it did. There are many reasons. One reason is that President Obama struck many people as uh, the living avatar of a kind of hope, right? It was in the campaign slogans. Uh, President Obama struck many people as living evidence 
that we have moved beyond some of the darker uh, aspects of American political history and American culture. And for many people, that thought about President Obama was utterly incongruous with what we were seeing on our screens. This kind of thing was not meant to happen anymore. On the strength of this incongruity, uh, people said things like what Cornel West said on another of these news shows. He said, looking at a screen like this, the age of Obama is over, which is to say this optimism we had about the uh, racial history being broken on the rock of the Obama movement. That's gone. Next slide, please. So for many people, what happened in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014 is of a piece with a great many things that led to what some people started calling around 2020, the racial reckoning, right? This is the idea that the United States was finally coming to grapple with its racial history and the contradictions of its racial politics and the degree to which those politics were bound up with the politics of the nation. All of this was of a piece. And what encouraged people to take uh, the Ferguson moment seriously as a moment was the way it excavated some things that many of us preferred to keep hidden. This preference to keep unsavory things hidden is something like what James Baldwin referred to as innocence. It's something like what he has in mind in passages like the one on the screen in front of you from the fire next time. He wrote there, and I quote him, this is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen that they have destroyed and are destroying lives and do not know it and do not want to know it. It is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence which constitutes the crime. This is vital. This is a thought that aligns with some currents of thought in what some people call political epistemology. This is a current of thought that encourages us to accept the degree to which societies routinely produce ignorance about things of importance in just the way that we aspire to produce knowledge about things of importance, right? There are things we prefer to keep hidden. There are Freudian ways to think this thought. There are Baldwinian ways to think this thought. And the idea here is that one of the things that the Ferguson moment did was lay bare some things that we had declined as a country to know. This is where I begin to find the ground of hope, right? The darkness that attaches to what the Wall Street Journal editorial staffer referred to as the sort of surreal nature of the moment of these split screen images, right? The darkness of that moment, the confusion, the puzzlement, the obscurity, right? In Spanish, we call dark times. Uh, tiempos oscuros, right? The obscurity of these of this moment is itself an indication that something crucial is being unveiled, right? One of the things that struck people about the Ferguson upheavals was not just the fact that the streets were on fire, not just the fact that people were protesting and that the police had come out in full military force to respond to often typically peaceful protests, right? but that no one paid attention until those kinds of things started to happen, even though the groundwork for the Ferguson upheavals had been laid by many, 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 many years of the Ferguson municipality routinely producing a certain kind of suffering and vulnerability among its citizens. The routine production of vulnerability and suffering is not of interest to us, only spectacular upheavals of violence. This itself is an indication of a certain kind of innocence of the kind that Baldwin was interested in. And the way that moment forced us to confront this embrace of innocence is, I want to suggest, productive. What's also productive in this moment is something that uh, Professor Eddie Glaude pointed us to in an essay in Theory and Event in 2015. He said, one of the things we see when we look at Ferguson is people on the ground doing the work of responding to these unfortunate and oppressive dynamics. And they've been there a long time. They've been there the whole time. We just weren't paying attention. So we have the scene of devastation, a scene of, of dashed hopes, a scene of uh, crushed optimism. Where can we find grounds for hope in this? We can find it in the fact that we are being forced to confront some things that we prefer to remain innocent of. We can find it in the fact that this forced confrontation continues to lay bare things that we would prefer to remain ignorant of. 
Baldwin's innocence is a kind of willful ignorance. It's not the, the opposite of culpability. It's an epistemic condition that is bound up with the prospects for the continuation of a certain kind of white supremacy. The grounds for hope are in the way routine ways of proceeding in support of manifest injustices have been disrupted and we have been forced to pay attention. Does that mean problems are solved? No. Does it mean the work does not continue? No. Does it mean the odds are not steep? No. It means that some things have been brought to our attention and we've been given an opportunity to grapple with them responsibly rather than irresponsibly in good faith rather than in bad faith. Faith, I'm saying we in the way Baldwin did. Many, many people, of course, knew these things. Robert Bella invited us many, many years ago to speak of the American religion, the American civil religion, right? A core tenet of that religion is we don't want to think about those things. The Ferguson moment forces us to. Next slide, please. So my second image comes from January 6th in 2021. I'll tell you why the image is named the way it is in a moment. Uh, this is a moment at which a great many people in the grip of a heaving sense of dismay and grievance took to the American capital to try to seize the seat of American power and were, depending on your views on these things, uh, we could describe, we could say what I'm about to say in different language, uh, but were egged on in this way, perhaps that's the least tendentious way to say it, to varying degrees by highly placed officials in the American federal government and elsewhere. This is, of course, a decisive moment. This was, of course, for many people, grounds for something like despair or for embarking on the road to despair. This is evidence that American democracy is in decline or in peril or in danger. The foundations of the Democratic Republic are shaking, right? We were forced to confront some things that, again, in the spirit of Baldwin, we had declined to attend to or to take seriously enough. But that confrontation, the issue of that confrontation was not clear. Next slide, please. Where's the hope in this? So I've referred to that image as Liberty's Manure following some language from Thomas Jefferson. In a letter from 1787, Jefferson said something that is routinely cited and routinely misquoted. Uh, what he actually wrote is the following, among many other things. What country can preserve its liberties if their rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. End of quote. People often take this language to support a view about revolution being a generational requirement. Uh, people often take this language as evidence that uh, the kind of thing we saw on January 6th is not only appropriate and permissible, but necessary and laudable under the right conditions. And then you have to argue with people about, about what those conditions were. I'm interested in Jefferson's language as a way of capturing what was at stake for some of the people in the image you just saw, but also as a point of entry to, I think, to an, I think, more defensible way of thinking something like the thought Jefferson had in mind. So once again, here, I want to turn to Baldwin. And once again, I want to turn to The Fire Next Time from 1963, roughly the same time as Howard Thurman's The Luminous Darkness, both in uh, the crucible of the Black American liberation struggle and a great many other struggles. Baldwin said, wrote, and I quote him, everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. This is at the end of The Fire Next Time. This is his way of saying, uh, or drawing the conclusions, some of the natural conclusions that follow from the repudiation of innocence, of the willful ignorance that he complains about, right? One of the logical conclusions of that move is to say, there are all of these practices you have undertaken and accepted, these institutions you have capitulated to and endorsed and sustained and supported, and you've done so uncritically, and you've done this essentially in bad faith. That is not an option for you now. Things that you thought were fixed and finished are in the making. Everything is in our hands. What does it have to do with January 6th? One of the things that Jefferson was after was something that the people in my country who insist on the uh, lofty achievements of our founders often forget. 
Our nation was created by humans trying to solve human problems. They were trying to solve problems with limited resources and information and using the tools that are available to all of us uh, as, the, as what Kant called the cricket timber of humanity, right? We are all cracked vessels doing the best we can. We undertake experiments and those experiments have to play out and they don't always play out the way we want and then we have to adjust. All of this is a way of gesturing at the contingency of our institutions and our practices and our uh, societal arrangements. Jefferson knew this. Jefferson knew a great many things. Some of them he often denied to himself, and we'll come to that. One of the things that January 6th should have laid bare to us is the contingency of our institutions, right? We found ourselves in that moment because a great many people thought Donald Trump would be constrained by our institutions and our norms. And if he did nothing else, Donald Trump reminded us, those are just norms. I don't have to be constrained by them. They are conventions. I am not a party to those conventions. I refuse them, which means that it takes work to sustain these institutions. They are not self-sustaining and self-executing, which means that everything is in our hands, which means that we can't rely, as some of us would argue Trump's predecessors did, on the sheer gravity of our institutions and their sheer majesty to constrain people who would undo them, who disagree with the reading of the project that allows for multiracial democracy. These institutions aren't self-executing. We cannot rely on them to do the work by themselves. We have to do the work. Everything now is in our hands. We know this, we can no longer deny this, and we've been given an opportunity to act on this knowledge, to take it seriously and to let it inform the way we engage with the, tra with the travails of the moment. Those, I think, are grounds for hope. Next slide, please. Moving soon to a close, the third and final image is an image that um, I did not have in mind, of course, at the beginning of this project. I could have had something like it in mind because the roots of this moment, the seeds of this moment had been planted many, many years ago. But I had other images in mind. I had uh, images of people struggling through the rubble in the earthquake in Haiti. I had images of uh, people uh, driving through the streets of Fukushima trying to escape a tidal wave, a tsunami. I had other images in mind, but uh, the events of the past week made it clear to me that it would be professional malpractice not to speak to this moment, this piece of our moment in the context of these reflections. So I just ran across this image the way those of you who've seen it, if you've seen it, probably did. It, it went viral. It emerged in the wake of Hamas's incredible and unjustifiable and brutal assault on Israel. It is an image of a father at his wit's end making a plea. The content of his plea you see on the screen in front of you. I want to ask of Hamas, don't hurt them. Don't hurt little children. Don't hurt women. If you want me instead, I'm willing to come. He issued this plea after discovering that his wife and children had been abducted and having no other recourse. There was no plan yet. Uh, there was no, as far as we can tell from people reporting on the ground, from the ground, uh, there was very little communication about what was happening and what to expect. There was nothing else he could do than make this plea. What interests me about this image is the nakedness of the plea and the shape of it. It is, in essence, a plea to the common humanity of the Hamas militants. Next slide, please. It is a plea that in its nakedness and in its vulnerability put me in mind of the work of the great Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas. I'll come to Levinas in a second. I want to dwell for a moment on this image and the way that Morrison invites us to dwell on these images. We see in this, in that image a man as i say at his wit's end he would make the rounds of the news shows and other uh media opportunities later he would be more composed he would be he would look more like i imagine he looked in his everyday life but in that moment we saw the nakedness of his hurt the urgency of his appeal and in seeing all of that i was put in mind of uh, one of the signal ideas of 
the work of Emmanuel Levinas. Um, I don't know Levinas's work as well, so uh, take this as a down payment on a course of future study. But anyone who knows anything about Levinas will know that he said something about the face of the other, and that in some way, a confrontation with what he called the face of the other was meant to be something like a ground for ethics. I say something like because that's a misleading way of putting it, as Levinas commentators will let us know. I have reached the limit of my capacity to translate Levinas for you, so I'll turn to a commentator who is a uh, much better position than I am, Diane Perpich. On Levinas's behalf, after working through the evolution of the idea of the face of the other in his work, she says the following. Realizing our humanity for Levinas will not be a matter of acceding to lofty dogmas or deifying some mysterious other. It will be nothing more or less than recognizing that I am not alone to act, that my actions create the conditions under which the other person perishes or flourishes. Some of what's at stake there is trying to find words for the phenomenological event in which we are confronted with another and have the experience of having a claim made on us. Something is happening there that we credit that has some bearing on our experience as ethical beings and moral agents. And this transaction, this phenomenological encounter is what that distraught father was trying to set in motion in making that plea. Now, why do I take this as ground for hope? Not because these kinds of pleas are new, right? I know nothing about that father's politics, I don't know if he registered similar pleas from his Palestinian counterparts as they've emerged over the years as they have in the way that he hoped his plea would register, right? These pleas are not new, but this moment is new. And a willingness to credit the humanity of the participants, the parties to this encounter, that willingness seems to have more momentum behind it than I at least remember it having in recent memory. Uh, I'm put in mind of yet more language from Thomas Jefferson. I keep coming to Jefferson because he is rich, a rich source for reflections like this. He was a full participant in institutions and practices and activities that we, without hesitation, now regard as morally impermissible, as morally disastrous, as morally monstrous. And he knew it. If you read the notes on the state of Virginia, if you read his letters, he knew it. And grappled with the ambivalence of being bound up in this system and recognizing its impermissibility, its indefensibility at the same time. He said in one of his letters, speaking of the institution of slavery and its sexual violence, its forced labor and the other evils attached to it. We have a wolf by the ear and can neither hold him nor safely let him go, which is to say we're bound up in something that I don't see a way out of. Right? I would say to Brother Jefferson, in the context of this thought, that the first step towards getting out of it may be to decline to regard your participant in this encounter as a wolf and to accept that they are human and that their suffering may make some claim on you in a way that can temper what might otherwise be a purely reactive response to a provocation, right? To credit the possibility of a different kind of encounter and engagement than the kind that we would think of in response to wolves. Next slide, please. Moving swiftly to a close, I passed over a great many things that require attention, right? I've said very little, for example, uh, about the sort of patriarchal overtones of the distraught father's plea right? Don't harm women and children, right? There is a great deal to unpack there. I said almost nothing about the, the, the river of details, right? That swamps all of the images that I've shared with you, but this is why I approach them as images following Tony Morrison's lead. They are points of entry to a way of engaging a richer scene, a richer scene that to some degree we can cultivate better responses to, more careful and more intelligent and more thoughtful and more wise ways of engaging. Great many details I've set aside, not because they're not there, but because I was keen in the very short time that I very nearly used up to make just a few points. Those are the ones you see on the screen in front of you. 
We live in a moment that is replete with scenes of devastation. These scenes of devastation give us ample warrant for thinking of ourselves as inhabiting a dark time. I want to suggest that that darkness is not seamlessly bad or problematic, that that darkness is a way of or contains possibilities that we can seize and realize. I want to say that these scenes of devastation can be transfigured into images of hope and that the key to doing that with respect to the images, the particular images I've shared with you, the key to doing that re involves refusing the kind of innocence that Baldwin objected to, embracing the kind of agency that we often forget is bound up with our human institutions, and recognizing the humanity of our opponents, and doing something like counseling compassion, the prospect of suffering with our fellows in the face of or in the context of moments of encounter and contest. Final slide, please. So again, the thought is not that simply that the night is darkest before the dawn or that the darkest night allows us uh, to notice the beauty of the stars. The thought is that the darkness is not simply, simply something to get through on the way to goodness, but that itself contains possibility. In thinking that thought, I'm led to Thomas Stearns Eliot, whose political convictions I disagree with on a great many levels, uh, but whose insight into the interiority of the human condition, an insight that he obtained in part by uh, working through what some people still call Eastern religions, uh, that his insight is in some ways unmatched, his ability to express it is in some ways unmatched. Um, I find this language in the four quartets. I said to my soul, be still and let the dark come upon you, which shall be the darkness of God. As in a theater, the lights are extinguished for the scene to be changed with a hollow rumble of wings, with a movement of darkness on darkness which is in part to say, sometimes the darkness is the darkness of the theater as the scene is being changed. Sometimes things are happening. Sometimes the darkness makes it possible for things to happen in ways we cannot yet fully discern. Moving from the metaphor of the theater to the realities of our lives, the burden for us then is to figure out what this darkness portends and whether we will receive what is happening passively, perhaps reactively, perhaps angrily, perhaps in despair or whether we will consider ways to participate in the new stage that is being set. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Taylor. Um, so once again, I'd just like to reiterate the point that all viewers are very welcome to post their questions using the box to the right of your screen and while we're waiting for those questions to appear before me and be collected um i will ask a question uh, thank you so much for that professor taylor it was really encouraging um i guess what i would like to ask you about is a kind of um temptation towards despair or numbing oneself or distracting oneself that one might take in something close or we might call good faith um, when witnessing these scenes of devastation through a screen. Um, and I think that temptation comes from the idea that even if I use all these wonderful resources that you've just offered me, I maybe and, and knows the wrong word but that's the word that came up i know that the people in power the people whose actions really can make a difference maybe won't use these resources um oh, so so knowledge isn't right there but there's this sense of it's what we would say to ourselves oh i know the situation is going to get worse how how can how can the individual avoid that that kind of temptation in your view thank you for the question that is a, a a huge question it is the in some ways the principal question right and it points to a connection between uh the central moral psychological category i've tried to invoke which is the notion of hope and a very closely related concept which is the concept of faith right um, 
And there are some people who make this connection. Uh, Melvin Rogers has written a wonderful book working through some moments in the Black American political tradition uh, using the, something like a notion of faith, right? Uh, here's some of, here's another way into the kind of thing I'm trying to say, right? I started with the image of the Obama moment, what some people call the age of Obama. Many people, including many people who think of themselves as Afro-pessimists, have taken the, the, the hope, the appeal to hope in that moment as a sign of a kind of uh, inappropriate optimism to which they want to oppose a kind of more realistic, more austere, more responsible pessimism. And there's a lot to say about what pessimism means for them, and that's very complicated. Set that aside. I want to suggest, following people like Cornel West and others, that there is something in between, right? That optimism has its dangers, pessimism has its dangers, but a faith in the possibilities of human experimental action, action undertaken in solidarity with like-minded others and with others we might persuade, right? A faith in the possibility that that action can achieve something, not must achieve something, not will necessarily achieve something, but can achieve something, right? One of the things I'm trying to do is uh, find resources to shore up that faith, right? So that's just to situate your question. Another way um, or another piece of the enterprise of shoring up those resources involves looking back at history, right? And so one of my favorite examples for this is uh, Howard Zinn in A People's History of the United States. He tells a story of uh, conversations unfolding in the Oval Office near the end of what people in my country call the Vietnam War about the prospect of dropping another atomic bomb in that region to bring the hostilities to a close or to try to bring the hostilities to a close. And there were people protesting outside the Oval Office. And the people outside the Oval Office could reasonably have said to themselves uh, what you just said, right? We have our political and moral convictions, but those people don't share them and they have the power and we can't influence them. And they could have gone home, but they didn't. And there is evidence from the tapes from the White House, right, that people in the Oval Office heard this and were discouraged. That we can't do this thing we're contemplating because look at those people, look at what, think about what will happen. All of which is to say, one of the reasons to try to do the kind of thing I'm trying to do, to try to short the existential resources for what in some context you might think of as resistance, but what you might also just think of as um, tragic action, right? One reason to do that is because it's hard to know which of your actions will bear fruit, right? It's hard to know which seed you plant will grow and flower, but you know that unless you plant some, nothing will flower. Thank you very much. Yeah, I see that it may be thinking more long-term, playing kind of long game. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. So um, some questions have come through. Um, the first question I can see is, um, I'm trying to get it up. Uh, would you, here we go, get it up on the screen. Would you agree that academic aesthetics is politically bankrupt too, which has serious implications for our hopes, hopes in that field. And there's a second part to that question, which I will share at the same time. Oh. The second part is here. If you agree, do you think it has to do with academic elitism and exclusivism? Good, good, thank you. Um, whether an institution or a practice or a discipline or a profession, any human enterprise, whether that thing is uh, politically bankrupt will depend on your political convictions and people have different convictions and uh, there are convictions one might have in virtue of which one could easily and without hesitation say, right, uh, academic aesthetics is politically bankrupt. The easiest path to that conclusion might involve a similar claim about the higher education sector as a whole or about professional academia or about uh, specialized academic scholarship, right? There are all sorts of critiques to bring to bear on that family of enterprises. 
I have some of those critiques, but I don't have them. I, I am not interested typically in raising those worries in a way that would lead me to that harsher conclusion. I think there are political difficulties, but I think there are possibilities inherent in those institutions that make it still worthwhile for people to inhabit them and try to uh, use their resources to do productive things. One path to that thought runs through the ideas of people like Fred Moten and Stefano Harney and other people who have argued that, um, to borrow some language from Moten and Harney, uh, the academy as it stands is morally indefensible, but also indispensable. It's morally indefensible, but it is also indispensable, right? Which is to say that it hoards resources that are of considerable value to the human experiment, and that then it is the burden of people like us to inhabit those spaces and smuggle those resources out to other people who can use them, right? So politically bankrupt institution that still has resources that can be reallocated and redistributed in ways that are of value, which means that some people have to inhabit them to get access to those resources. I'm inclined at a minimum to tell a story like that. I'm usually a marginally more optimistic than that or more encouraged than, than that. Not a lot more, but a little more. Uh, so that's the kind of story I would tell. It, the worries about those institutions or that family of institutions and practices does have a great deal to do with a deal to do with academic elitism and specialization and what it means to be a part of a discipline in the higher ed sector as it is currently constituted. There are a lot of critiques to bring to bear on that enterprise or constellation of enterprises, but there is still there are still resources there that are important and that we need access to. Great, thank you very much. Um, in, oh, we have another question here from the audience. Uh, oh, it's not, oh, oh here we go. Um, Got the whole thing up. Oh, it's going to look very tiny, so I'll read it aloud from the other screen I have. Is there a worry that the sheer amount of imagery of destruction and despair we're bombarded with, especially on social media, might lead to desensitization, which might further encourage Baldwin's innocence? Yes, I think there are reasons to worry about this. There are reasons to worry, as some people say, about what, um, uh, what some of us call uh, disaster porn, right? That is to say, the, the practice of um, insisting on highlighting, recirculating avidly, uh, rapidly recirculating images of unbelievable devastation, right? For the sake of getting click rates up or whatever it is, right? Yes, there are real reasons to worry about that. And that, in a way, goes back to a piece of, of uh, Dr. Edwards' first question that I, that I uh, didn't really take up, right? By referring to my project as a way of excavating and recommending certain kinds of existential resources for inhabiting this moment more productively uh, than we otherwise might. In the background of that is a conception of human activity as unavoidably and irretrievably, be, irre irretrievably bound up with uh human social practices right so that we are bound up in a network of mutuality some people would say right um and so some of what that means has to do with caring for and regulating your exposure to and access to and relationships with other people right including people not on screens right some of that has to do with curating and tending your own life in ways that allow you to have health to be placed in it in healthy ways which might mean as an individual regulating your exposure to these difficult images which might which might mean as a member of a family regulating the exposure of more vulnerable family members of those images which might mean as a participant in a municipal government or in a regulatory agency right thinking with others in a democratic spirit that's accountable to the demos about ways of managing the flow of information right 
the kind of story I'm trying to tell is consistent with a conception of political agency that works at all of these levels, right? I've spoken at a very high level of abstraction because I'm a philosopher and that's what we do and I'm trying to get at these existential resources. But the point is to free up those resources so that we can inhabit these different levels in productive ways, right? And so there are lots of ways. Yes, this is a worry. There are lots of ways to respond to the worry. And doing so is part and parcel of shoring up the resources that enable us to navigate this world more productively than we otherwise might. Thank you so much. And another question has come through. Um, I'll just see if you see it. It's come up tiny again, so um, bear with that one in March. Uh, are there differences um, between individual senses of hope each of us may feel based on our political views and personal dispositions versus hope on a collective level that can lead to impactful action. The short answer is surely yes, right? Uh, and this goes back to one of the first uh, gestures I made to uh, the fact that some of the answers we would give to these different questions will depend on uh, our commitment to certain kinds of political or ethical convictions, um, and we will differ about those things, right? And so uh, part of the burden of productive conversation about these things involves teasing out, uh, figuring out where exactly the differences are rooted and finding ways to distinguish tensions that are, or differences that are semantic from those that are kinetic, right? Finding places or opportunities for forging common ground and figuring out what things are non-negotiable, right? So um, in that way and in other ways, there are these differences, right? So depending on your political convictions and your sense of what the good life is and your sense of uh, the prospects for uh, the realization of certain particular things you value, you may have a different orientation to the uh idea that hope is warranted right you might have depending on what your sense of the thickness or thinness of the political as an appropriate dimension of human activity you may think all i need is hope for me and my family and y'all can go got that other stuff people will have different views about all of these things what's at stake for those of us who are committed to some kind of democratic project is holding open the space where we can think together about what this looks like holding open the space where we can think together in full, uh, fully mindful of the burdens of equal concern and respect for everyone, right? Holding open a space where we can deliberate together about the consequences of our conjoint activity right? and what that means for your individual aspirations and life plans will depend on what those are. Uh, but our burden as participants in a democratic society is to find some way forward together and so maybe there's value in distinguishing uh, the shared hope that we as citizens may have in this project from the hope I have as a private citizen for uh, pursuing the life plan that my God requires, for example. Right? Those can be different things. Yes, I'm interested in the broader political project that seems in so many ways to be imperiled and seems uh, in its ineptness in the forms in which it is inept to be getting in the way of the prospect of continued human inhabitation of this planet. So. Yeah, great, thank you. And it seems to me that part, part of that, something just came, clicked for me there, that part of the aspect of like an authentic embracing of agency is embracing one's limitations as an individual, right? So if you think as an individual, you can feel that overwhelm. Embracing agency means entering into dialogue with others and, and acknowledging that we need to work as a group or as a collective to, to instigate some kind of change. So, okay. Yeah. Um, does that, so do you have a point not to make on that? Yeah, just very briefly, uh, just in that spirit, I think about the, the, the way in which and the degree to which something like what many people would call consciousness raising is a crucial component in uh, social movements, right? It's an epistemic project, right? Our burden is to get you to realize you're not alone in this, right? That there's a story to tell about the world and your journey through it that 
aligns you with a great many other people with whom you ought to be um, um, allied, right? There, there is, this is a crucial moment in social movements, right? Precisely in ways that you've, you've pointed to. And I think that's a nice question, a question that follows nicely from that point. Um, how would you differentiate ambition and hope in political settings? This is a question that taken in the right spirit could lead us back to the uh, debates about the nature of hope that Professor Stockdale and I have bracketed. Um, I am still probably not super interested in engaging in those, getting into the weeds of those debates. What I will say as a sort of down payment maybe on a fuller answer is that uh, one of the reasons hope has become a going concern in the kind of political philosophy. I was raised to practice uh, following a long history of being a going concern in other spaces, my existentialist pragmatist, for example, um, and others, uh, is that it captures something about something that some people would describe as spiritual, something that connects to the thing I was calling faith earlier, something that has to do with uh, the stores of vital energies, William James might say, that allow us to engage with our fellows and with our world in ways that uh, are difficult to countenance, right? Um, without some buttressing, right? Ambition doesn't capture those things necessarily, right? Different people use these words in different ways, of course. Uh, but it's possible to think of ambitions just as things we want to bring about, as things that I want to secure for my own purposes. But I, I, I have collective ambitions for my people or my state or my party or whatever it is. But ambition, we tend to use the word ambition in ways that don't capture this richer, more sort of existential, perhaps spiritual dimension of hope. Right? To hope for something is to hold out the possibility that it can be brought into being, even if the prospects are uncertain, right? And to commit myself to it in a way that opens the door to religious fervor or to spiritual commitment or to other kinds of things like that. Ambition just seems like a thinner notion that doesn't capture all of those things, I think. Thank you. And um, this it's again very small. I'll, I'll read it out. Oh, oh, has it? Oh gosh, hold on, I've lost it. There it is. Um, uh, would you consider a period of so called darkness as necessary for uncovering and, in front and confronting structural innocence? If not, how else might may it be addressed? This thought will require um, being mindful of the possibility that this metaphor will will lose its purchase on us, right? There's a point at which the metaphor ceases to do the work we need them to do, and then we have to exchange them for other things, right? Uh, so there, there will be a point at which the appeal to the metaphor of darkness will cease to serve its purpose. Um, depending on how we cash it out, that point may come sooner for some of us than others. Uh, but holding open the possibility that it, it can still do this work. One way to think of it is the way that T.S. Eliot pointed to in my last slide, right? It's a way that I would cash out in a different context by using uh, some language from Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, by using a kind of phenomenological, phenomenological analysis that Peirce bequeathed to the American pragmatist on which one of the things we do when we strive to engage in more intelligent action rather than less is accept the burden of cultivating intelligent habits, habits that can be productive, that can help us navigate through the world intelligently. Habits don't always do this work, which means we must keep open and alive to the possibility that they must be critiqued and reconstructed, right? And so one of the things that provokes reflection on this sort of pragmatist phenomenology that person offers us, and you find versions of this in other places, there's a way to get it in the phenomenological tradition as such, uh, one of the things that provokes reflection is the experience of being disrupted, right? The experience of being brought up short, 
right? And you might think of that as a kind of darkness, right? I knew where everything was. I knew how to do everything I was trying to do. And then all of a sudden, I'm groping, right? I don't know my way about anymore. And I have to figure some things out. You could extend, you can imagine extending the metaphor of darkness to cover that kind of experience. That's kind of what I had in mind. I didn't want to go through the purse stuff to get to it. But that's kind of what I have in mind. I think in some places, especially in the four quartets, that's what Elliot has in mind, right? This is part of the point, some people would say, of a certain kind of training with uh, uh, mindfulness traditions, right? Or techniques of a certain of certain strains in Buddhist meditation, right? That you have to quiet the mind, right? And be present. And to be present is in part to set aside briefly, provisionally, the burden of anticipating and planning and mapping, right? Um, you might think of that as a kind of darkness and as a kind of darkness that opens onto the possibility of doing things differently, of disrupting old habits, of finding new ways forward. So yeah, I think I think there's a way to do it. Great answer. Um, and we have another question here and I'll read, I have a full question here before me, so I'll read it out. Refusing innocence, is this primarily about past contributions for a current wrong? Or is Israel-Palestine the kind of situation where refusal of innocence is about how we react now in the West? Very good, thank you. This is a, a really helpful question because it allows me to, to flesh out the appeal to innocence in a way that can, I hope, forestall some uh, confusions. It's a kind of confusion that Baldwin knowingly flirted with and courted, uh, but thought it was worth taking up uh, given the nature of his project. So when I speak of innocence in this context, I really do mean something like what I mentioned this earlier, uh, what people working in political epistemology have in mind when they think about um, irresponsible ways of carrying the burdens of being a responsible, of being an epistemic agent. Right. There are all sorts of ways in which, uh, especially under the conditions that Baldwin is interested in and in the situations that I tried to work through today, uh, there are all sorts of ways in which people decline to know things that they could easily know. There are all sorts of ways in which societies decline to position their inhabitants. Uh, in ways that make it easier rather than harder for them to know basic things about the social world that they have to navigate. Um, in my country, in the state of Florida and states like Florida, my home state of Tennessee in particular, there are all these movements to, from the very top down, from the governor's office down, to constrain the things that we can teach, that public schools can teach middle young children about slavery for example right we have to hide the difficult truths and just trumpet the virtues of the american experiment these are ways of cultivating a certain kind of ignorance about the world we inhabit so that's what Baldwin's interested in that's what innocence means it means a kind of willful ignorance a refusal to know things we could know that blocks awareness of our mutual embeddedness in a morally problematic situation now to say that is not yet to say that any single person is guilty of some particular distinguishable discrete harm or sin or violation. It's to say that there is a systematic problem. We are all impacted by and enmeshed in, and it would be better if we recognized our location in that problem rather than denied it and pretended it didn't exist. So the innocence in play here is an epistemic condition, willful ignorance and willfully cultivated or willful ignorance that is cultivated in various ways by certain kinds of social institutions, right? That has a certain kind of affective and existential payoff, right? I get to extol myself or think of myself as a seamlessly virtuous person who has no connection to any of the sins of the past. You may not be responsible for them, but the world you inhabit, the life you live is related to them in ways that you might think make you accountable with the rest of us for finding a path forward that is just and fair and appropriate. 
So it's not innocence, the opposite of which is guilt. It's innocence, the opposite of which is a critical, self-critical sense of one's relationship to the moral difficulties of one's time and one's place. Great, thank you very much. And there's another uh, question that popped up. Uh, how do we capture um, and maintain the essence of being human as we continue to move into a digital age? This is a very difficult question for me in particular because I'm old enough to find considerable discomfort with most of the things that we think of when we talk about moving into a digital age. Uh, so I will offer that as a, um, as a preface and as a, perhaps an opportunity to discount my answer appropriately. Uh, but one, one, there are a couple of pretty straightforward things to say. One thing to say is that the essence of being human is something that we must continue to discuss and debate and argue about and explore and consider together. It is not obvious, I don't think, what that means and what it involves. It is not obvious that what's most salient about this doesn't change over time as our conditions change and our capacities change as we extend them technologically and in other ways, right? And so the essence of the human is an ongoing conversation and we have to maintain and support and curate the spaces where we can have the conversation, which is in part to say, we have to take seriously the importance of the humanities. That's what they're for. Um, this again is something I'm in, uh, encouraged to say by uh, currents of thought and practice in my home country and in, in, in what I know of, of, of your country. Um, it has become fashionable and popular to cultivate and express a deep and abiding skepticism about the worth and value of the humanities. What good is that business? It doesn't help you get a job. It doesn't make you rich. It doesn't do all these things. But it does do the things that should guide and constrain the other things, right? And so here, one, I could go on and on, and you all could probably do it better than I could, but one simple and obvious answer to this is we need to maintain the spaces and give ourselves the room and the freedom to engage in discussions about what the human is and to connect those discussions to the traditions that have emerged as people have tried to answer that question. We cannot and should not pretend that it is a new question. We can take up anew as if none of this stuff ever happened. So, so some of what's involved is that. In addition, and very briefly bringing this to a close, some of what's involved is refusing another kind of innocence. Um, the innocence that comes with an uncritical triumphalism about our technological prowess and powers, right? Technological innovation can be wonderful. It can bring us a great many wonderful things. But it is fashionable, especially around places where I now live in California, for people to think that sheer technological innovation will just solve problems by itself. And that seems obviously wrong. The innovations must be mobilized into projects, human projects, that we monitor, critique, engage, and undertake mindful of our ethical commitments, right? So we have to keep thinking about what it means to be human. We have to keep thinking about technology as a resource for us and as a tool that we can deploy for better and for, for good and for ill. Now, there's a lot more to say about the details of things like AI. Uh, we don't have space to do it, and I'm not competent to do it. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got another question that's just popped through. Uh, um, I will read it aloud. Some pessimists that reject meliorism have thought that recognizing the ubiquity of suffering is crucial for confronting it or dulling its sting. Is this view a danger of pessimism regarding innocence? Hmm. 
I might need to hear more about the question, but if I'm understanding it correctly, I'll, I'll restate what I think is going on. Uh, forgive me for being dense. Uh, and then I'll say something about what I think is going on. Um, so I've offered you a glimpse of a picture on which there are these different positions one can occupy with respect to the prospects for the future and uh, productive human projects. One place on that picture involves a kind of pessimism on which hope is never warranted or uh, the prospects are extraordinarily dim. Another place is a kind of optimism where uh, obviously we will triumph and it's a seamless upward march to progress or something. The place I've tried to occupy is one might describe as a kind of meliorism or as a tragic sensibility or tragic comic sensibility or as uh, something that refuses both the excesses of optimism and pessimism and embraces instead the sense that uh, it is important to insist on the possibility that human agency will win out. It is important to insist on the value of human voluntaristic experimentation, mindful of the, the unavoidable possibility of defeat, but mindful also of the sometimes uh, indiscernible resources and prospects for success. As I said earlier, it's hard to know which seeds will flower, but it is easy to know that nothing will flower if no seeds are planted. So that's the picture. The question I think is that uh, one way to reject this kind of view is to say that it is too dismissive of suffering and you have to insist on suffering or else you will miss something of value about the human experience and fail to prepare yourself to deal with the slings and arrows of fate, right? And I think the last part of the question is whether that piece uh, or that way of refusing meliorism is attached to the kind of innocence Baldwin worried about. I think that's the question. Um, so to the first part, I have, so for me, one of the things that's at stake in carving out the sort of meliora space between optimism and pessimism is precisely to create room to take suffering seriously. Um, if I were a different sort of person with different sorts of skills, I would at this point turn to Buddhism and talk about the inevitability of suffering and life of suffering, which isn't a grounds for being sad and depressed all the time. It's just a recognition that things will turn, right? There's gain and loss. And, and uh, praise and blame. And that is the uh, unavoidable uh, dyna dynamism of life. That just is what it is. And so the first thing you have to do is accept that. And then, you know, you accept some other things, right? Um, uh, impermanence and the transience of everything, right? And so you should not be surprised when people die because that's just kind of how it goes, right? And in the same way in which you can prepare yourself for the inevitability of death, you can prepare yourself for the inevitability of suffering. So there's one path to this insight that runs through Buddhism. I take that very seriously. And for me, any kind of responsible melioration will take that seriously. It's one of the reasons for refusing optimism. Um, maybe a way to locate this thought in the context of the view that Baldwin worked out is in relation to a certain kind of American optimism and progressive the sense of progressivism, right? This is what for some Afro pessimists is at stake and refusing it is at stake and refusing the optimism of the Obama moment, right? You people thought this was easy. You people thought it was a seamless upward march to the racial utopia, right? That was wrong. Now you're depressed because you misunderstood the nature of this enterprise, right? Something like that is in play for Baldwin, and particularly for people who read Baldwin. Um, and I think that's right. But the alternative to that doesn't have to downplay the importance of suffering, right? It just has to locate it properly on the economy of human function. Okay, um, there's a question here, another one that's popped up. Um, Oh, I'll see if I can make it pop up again. What kind of levers of power do you think human agency should be reaching for with hope? So this is another question that highlights the, the distance from between the 30,000 foot view that I've tried to offer in a broadly philosophical spirit 
and the on the ground work that must unfold. Uh, hopefully empowered by the kinds of things I've tried to highlight, not necessarily empowered by the things I've said in particular, but by the kinds of things I've tried to, to point to, right? So I think of the thing I've been calling hope as a kind of, this is a little crude, but you'll see the point, a kind of a fuel or motive force that empowers us to engage in uh, productive activity at a great many levels, at any level that makes sense for us. And so at this point, we are forced back to the thing I kept saying earlier about the the difference that it makes uh, to our sense of our prospect, the difference that our different political commitments and convictions make to our sense of our prospects and our sense of what counts as an appropriate plan. So which levels of power are of interest to you will depend on what your analysis of the political situation you're trying to intervene in and what you think power is and all that kind of stuff. Bracketing as much as possible, all of that, I will just point to two kinds of things that locate some of the points of intersection between the story I'm telling and the kinds of things we might say uh, a little closer to the ground. One of the things that some people found endlessly frustrating about the run up to what some folks call the Trump era is the astounding and utter quiescence of the Democratic Party in the United States to the brewing possibilities, right? There was a kind of optimism about the power of our norms and institution uh, that discouraged people from accepting the burdens of agency that Jefferson and others point us to, right? Um, I have examples of this. I won't bore you with the examples. The point is that there were moments at which my leaders could have manipulated the levers of power that they actually had in their hands to do not crazy autocratic things, but perfectly straightforward, permissible things in view of a more critical reading of the political terrain. They declined to do it. Now we have to do it, and it's harder now, and the kind of thing I'm calling hope might provide some motive force for people to do that. Instead of retreating to the kind of despair or pessimism that comes from realizing, oh my God, our norms and institutions are not self-executing. All right, instead of retreating to that despair, it gives you five. Second thing is, goes back to the line I borrowed from Eddie Glaude's essay in Theory and Event, right? For all of the challenges that we might point to as evidence that we live in a dark time, there are people on the ground working and have been people on the ground working for a very long time to deal with those difficulties and dangers, right? There is a long story to tell about protest in Ferguson and mobilization in Ferguson. There is a long story to tell about efforts to promote the dignity and humanity of Palestinians in ways that do not seem to require, that do not at all require, that obviously decisively do not require organizations like Hamas, right? There are traditions of mobilization and activity and organization on the ground in all these places. And the people who participate in those activities are driven by some sense of faith that their activity will bear fruit, can bear fruit, and by the hope that the outcomes they want to bring about can be brought about. Right? Those are two points at which something like hope can provide motive force for engagement at different levels with different kinds of different levels or levers of power. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you so much to the audience for excellent questions. I just have one final question to close with, and it's a follow question of my own to that last question. And I guess I still have that, that lingering worry um, about the temptation towards despair. And, and, and this is a point, this is a problem for me, is that I think that the people that are most interested in using the kind of resources you provide for hope and, and action are those that tend to be or have the least power. And then, sort of, on, on the other hand, those people who are most protected from global tragedy, most sort of immune to the kind of suffering we're seeing, seem to be so that, that 
they're for people with the most power, but then so then they're the least interested in sort of using these kind of resources as well. So I don't know if you if you can speak to that. So maybe acknowledge that or maybe correct that by way of conclusion. Good. I can try. Uh, two thoughts immediately occur to me. One is a line from a remarkable story by Borges called uh, Saint Emmanuel the Good. Um, a character in this story, the main character, is a priest who does not believe in God, if I remember the story correctly. And at one point, we find in that story a line like this. Faith is a continual struggle against doubt, which I read as a kind of... Um, which I read in the spirit of Kierkegaard as a way of locating the kind of enterprise that faith is, right? This is why when I teach philosophy of religion, I don't teach the proofs and I don't teach that stuff, right? I teach Kierkegaard and I teach Wittgenstein and Dewey and other kinds of things, right? Faith is a continual struggle against doubt. Faith is not the kind of thing I can demonstrate the appropriateness of to you. Faith is a posture you take to a path you might take through the world in light of certain kinds of things you value, in the grip of the possibility that these things, in fact, are valuable and shape your life and ought to shape your life. Right? Faith is a continual, it's an ongoing thing. Political struggle is the same way, right? So sometimes when people like me tell stories like this, it may sound as if we're trying to provide a theory that justifies once and for all the kind of activity one should undertake in the grip of, grip of one's ethical convictions. It's not that kind of thing, right? This is the reason people go to church every Sunday to hear the sermon. So they hear the person tell them things they already know, but they take encouragement from it because that's the kind of creatures we are, right? These are continual struggles that we undertake. So that's the first thought, that this is a matter of process. It's not a matter of proof. It's a matter of ongoing activity. It's not a matter of immediate resolution or final resolution. The other thought is a thought that I take not from Borges, but from the political theorist Sheldon Wolin, who invited us many years ago to think of democracy uh, not as a series of or a set of institutions or a constellation of practices or even as a set of norms necessarily, right? It's not about one person, one vote. It's not about free and fair elections. It's about those things. But it's not crucially about those things. It's about an orientation to the demos, an orientation to political projects in virtue of which one is always open to the prospect of the needs of the demos and the requirements of the demos, the ordinary people, uh, being imperiled by elites. Democracy in this sense, on this picture, is always fugitive. It is always something that we must defend. It is always something we must defend in shifting ways, on shifting in, in the wake of shifting current, in the context of shifting conditions, right? Not a thing you do once and for all. It's a thing that's ongoing and it's about the very thing that I think animated your question, right? The sense that there are the powerful people over there and these little people over here and how do we do the thing, right? Some of that has to do with telling ourselves the right kinds of stories about the enterprise we've embarked upon. And a central part of that story I've been trying to suggest must involve or must follow from attending to the existential conditions under which we can do this work and find common cause with each other and hold out the hope that our actions on the ground, however fruitless they seem, can have an impact and can help bring about the world we want to see. Right? It's about process. It's about faith. Uh, it's not just about, it's also about tactics and strategy and intelligent analysis of the conditions and all of those things. But the taxes, tactics and the strategy and the intelligent analysis only matter if we have the strength to act on them, to insist on them, to see them through. And that strength is the thing I'm trying to support with an appeal to something like hope. Thank you so much. Um, much needed grounds and um, strategy for finding hope in these devastating times. Um, although the audience, so you can't see the audience, so I would like to give you an applause on behalf of everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Wolsey-Tales. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure.